There we go. <clears throat> okay. So let's take a look at this fancy word called stoichiometry, chapter three. <clears throat> stoichiometry is a uh, this is derived from the root meaning of uh, uh, count. Actually, this part right here is the counting part. That's where it's counting. Yeah. Anyway, <coughs> stoichiometry in chemical terms is a way of <coughs> accounting for quantities that go into the reaction and quantities come out of the reaction. So it's almost as if you're budgeting. <clears throat> the chemical reaction. Isn't that something less than zero? I think you're right. I think yeah. it, I think his last name was Stoichio. Yeah. It's you know derived from a that. person. Yes. <clears throat> so how are we going to count? Well, the problem is atoms and molecules are too small. So we got to devise a way that we can we can count them. And the reason we need to count them is that reactions don't occur based on mass. They occur based on numbers. Right. Things interact, masses don't. So uh, the method that is was devised was is called counting by weighing. Atoms are too small. Um, and in order to use this method, we have to treat objects as if they behaved identically. Now we know that's not strictly true because each element has its own set of behaviors. But when we're actually doing the counting, um, we have to assume that everything we count is uh, roughly the same size. And I'll explain that in just a minute. So <clears throat> we're looking for, uh, if we're going to weigh something, and again, I use weighing interchangeably with massing. So if we're going to weigh something uh, and use that to count something, we need to assume that uh, every object in the substance that we're weighing has the same average mass as everything else. So here's an example. <clears throat> we, uh, um, we weigh a container of marbles and we subtract the value for the container. So we know that we're only weighing the marbles. And the marbles weigh 394.8 grams. So how can we find out how many marbles there are in the container without actually pouring them out and counting them? <clears throat> so the method that's devised is um, we take what we consider to be a representative sample of the marbles and find out how much each one weighs. So we take out 10 marbles and weigh them. It turns out that they weigh 37.6 grams for 10 marbles. Right. So that means that each marble Right, 3.760 grams per marble. Okay, and in case you haven't noticed, that's a conversion factor. In this case, we want to find out how many marbles there are. Right, so we're going to convert 394.8 grams into the number of marbles. So how do we do it? Well, we need marbles on top, right? And grams on the bottom. That's so grams here in the numerator will cancel grams in the denominator. And then marbles will stay on top for our answer. And the net result of that is you divide 3.76 into 394.8 and you end up with 105 marbles. So this is one of those examples where 
um, you can basically ignore chemistry and just use conversion factors. This works for marbles, works for atoms, molecules, ions, anything. All you need is the proper conversion factor. And we're eventually going to get there. I promise. <clears throat> oh. Got it? Okay. So, <clears throat> but in chemistry, we need a standard. The standard used to be oxygen. And I think probably because nearly every element on the earth is combined in some way or other with oxygen. At least all the metals are. Except for a few noble metals. Gold, gold platinum, palladium. Um, you can find those uncombined. But most elements are combined with oxygen like uh, silicon dioxide, sand, or uh, uh, aluminum oxide. You find a lot of that in bauxite. The ore that we use to produce aluminum, or iron oxide in iron ore, rust. Rust. Right. Um, so oxygen was the standard for a long time, and it was taken as 16. But it's difficult to isolate oxygen. It's difficult to contain it because it's gas, and because they didn't know for a while. Oxygen usually occurs that way. Right. So one oxygen is 16, but two oxygens in in the easiest, uh, most easily isolated version of oxygen is 32. So that introduced some some real problems with using it as a standard. <clears throat> Eventually, we settled on carbon. Carbon is a good uh, standard because you find you find it anywhere. All you need is uh, living material. You can ash it down, separate the carbon very easily, and you have your standard. Um, and the standard itself, of course, is um, one particular isotope of carbon. Right? So your laboratory needs to be pretty well equipped to do that. But um, if, you, if you've got the need and you've got the money, you can do it. Like 12, right? Yeah, carbon 12. Because that's the one that doesn't uh, decay. Right. Because carbon 13 decays to carbon 12 and carbon 14 goes to carbon 13. Right? Mm, but carbon 12 is stable also. Carbon 14 does decay, yes. Okay. But carbon 12 is the major isotope in naturally occurring carbon, so there's plenty of it around. And this is is uh, arbitrarily assigned the uh, mass of 12, carried out as far as one, atomic mass units. So one atom of, of carbon-12 is 12 atomic mass units, and everything else is related to that. Um, so um, you might have an isotope of oxygen that could that we learned early might be this with eight protons and eight neutrons, but its mass is not going to be exactly 16. It'd be related to this, it'll be a slight fraction off of 16. Okay. So if we assume that and we relate the others. Forms of carbon to that. So we're more working with other that, but it's just more isotopes. Yeah. Oh yeah. Just decay rapidly though. Oh yeah, yeah. So really the only two that are of significance to chemists are these two right here. Because this is like 0.01%. And that's what carbon 14 is what they use when they take the thing, right? Yes. Right. It's decay rate. Over time, it's, I don't remember exactly, it's something in the neighborhood of a thousand years, half life. Anyway, we're only interested in these two as chemists. Quantify. 
And um, uh, if we take that a relative abundance, let's see, that was 9889. And this one is 1.11%. Uh, this accounts for the lion's share. In fact, if you add those two up, you get 100%. So we're basically ignoring everything else. <clears throat> the reason I bring this up is not just the fact that carbon 12 is our standard, but we're going to use this relative abundance to explain why this value is not 12. Right, it's carbon 13 is more, ma more massive as yes. more to it than carbon 12. Right. It's a weighted average. That's a weighted average, kind of like a GPA. Right. A one hour course is worth less than a three or four hour course. So if you get an A in the four hour course, you're doing better than if you get an F in the four hour and an A in the one hour. So it's a weighted average. <clears throat> and we're going to use um, 13 for this one, realizing full well that it's not exactly 13, but it's close enough to make the, the illustration of weighted average. So the weighted average is, how much does this one contribute to the naturally occurring abundance of carbon? How much does this one contribute? Then you add them together. Because the singular, the singular neutron is not as, is not as, is it as weighty as a proton? I didn't think neutrons were as weighty. No, neutrons are just slightly heavier okay, than so a proton. That would be slightly heavier than 13. Mm -hmm, probably. Okay. Yeah. Um, and, and the, uh, the the difference is assumed to be um, when a, a radioactive decay occurs involving a neutron, it produces a proton plus a beta particle. I should write that not as an electron, but as a beta. So it, it loses a little mass of that beta particle plus some energy that's required to accelerate it. Well, that's your difference in mass. Anyway, so let's get back to this discussion. Now, what contribution does uh, carbon-12 have to the total? Well, it's the fractional amount. So this would be 0 0.9889 times 12. Okay, let's see if we can do that one already. Yeah, here we go. 0.9889% of 12 plus 1% of 13. Well, here we actually use the value. That's good. So this is 12 for the standard, and this is the actual mass of the uh, carbon 13 based on that standard. And we use a fractional amount because percent is a dimensionless number. So if, if we multiply this times that, and that times that, plus that, we come up with like 1,200, or 1,201, and that would work. We need a fraction of that. So this is the fractional equivalent of the percent times each one. And when you add those together, there we go. It comes out to 1,201, rounded off to two places. So if we round this off to two places, we get 12. That's where these values come from. All these values here, they're not uh, they're not mass numbers that we learned before, protons plus neutrons. They're atomic weights, atomic masses, which is a weighted average of the naturally occurring abundance of each one. Okay. So there's some of the like naturally occurring ones in the metals, right? And that's why they can vary. Uh, yeah, well, the, uh, periodically, the uh, IUPAC and the NIST get together and adjust the chart, but they usually adjust it out to maybe the fifth, sixth, seventh, or eighth digit, so it doesn't matter to us. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, that's true. Um, we try to use the uh, earthbound naturally occurring abundance. Uh, because that's where most chemists are, very few of them in space. <clears throat> oh, definitely not on other planets. But that is something that has to be taken into account when you start exploring other heavenly bodies. There may be 
uh, different moments of those isotopes. And very often, the difference in abundance is a fingerprint for the origin of that object. Right. Well, that's another topic. So that's, in order to count by weighing, um, the atomic mass unit is not exactly what we're looking for because that's atomic mass unit per atom. So I guess it could be if you could determine atomic mass units as a as a value. But we don't have balances that weigh in atomic mass units. They weigh in grams. Okay. So fortunately though, uh, there's another value. And let's see. I want to jump too far ahead of myself. Uh, let me talk about it now. There's another value called the mole. That's how you write the whole thing out and you abbreviate it. Go figure. Anyway, the mole is a number of things. Right? And if you have a mole of things equal to this, it, re relative to the periodic table, one mole of atoms. Right? If you have one mole of atoms, then that mole of atoms will weigh this value in grams. So now we have something we can hang our hat on. So, for instance, uh, well, carbon, our, our carbon is going to be one mole of carbon is 12 grams. Right. One mole of carbon equals 12.01 naturally occurring abundance. So since you have an equivalence, you now have a conversion factor. Right? If you know how many grams that you've weighed of carbon, then you can convert it to moles. And if you need numbers, then you can convert it to numbers of atoms. But the numbers of atoms conversion factor is really weird because neg it's ten to the twenty third times six. Is it negative twenty third? No, no, it's okay. positive. So yeah, it's a huge number. Yeah, that's a that's a that's a big number. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so now that we have this value, or the what we call the atomic mass of carbon, in, in these terms, so this is twelve point oh one grams per mole for carbon. Then, um, if we need um, Two moles, we just weigh out 24 grams. Or if we need, um, um, by the way, a mole of xenon would take up a lot of space as a gas to yeah. get 131 grams of that gas. Yeah, it's a huge volume. Yeah, and we'll be able to calculate how much that is when we get to the gas chapter. Okay. So now we can count by weighing. This is just an illustration of what you need to determine um, the percent composition of the different isotopes in a sample. You need a mass spectrograph. And uh, this, is, this is one type of mass spectrograph. It's called a magnetic sector. So you have these strong magnets here, and you have your sample and you accelerate it, you produce positive ions first, and then you accelerate them through an electric field and these two slits that collimates the beam, makes it straight. And then when it passes through this magnetic sector, uh, the magnetic field causes the ions to bend. And the ones that bend the most are the lightest ones. Right? Because you get the same force acting on all the ions, and the lighter one's going to bend more. So the lighter ones end up here, and the heavier ones end up there. And the electronics available in these instruments are fast enough. They can count individual strikes. So they can count individual atoms that are striking the detector. I think this really is schematic, because they usually don't have a detector like that. It's usually a single. Um, some type of response to, and they, they move the tube. 
like that. So they, they count a little while, while here, and then they count a little while here, and they just they form a spectrum that way. That's where the spectrum meter comes from. Yes, mass spectrum. There are, there are different types of mass spectrum. These are the expensive ones. If you buy a gas chromatograph with a mass spectrometer attached to it as a detector, um, they'll put a cheaper one on there. And I'm trying to think of what they call it. It's, uh, in this case, anyway, it can be done. Now, suppose we know that an element consists of this percentage of an isotope of that mass and this percentage of an isotope of that mass. What's the average atomic mass of that? So all we have to do is say 186.956. And um, we're going to use atomic mass units, which is fine. Multiply it by 0.626. And then the other isotope is 184.953. Multiply it times its abundance, 3740, right? and then add them together. Okay? In the interest of time, I'm not going to do that calculation. I think it's up here already. There you go. So when you add those two together, this will be like a little more than half of that, and this will be a little more than a third of that. Add them together, and you can check to be sure that you're accounting for everything. Just add these together, and it should be one, or very close to one, if you're accounting for all the isotopes. And that value is 186.2. I use AMU. They're both the same. Um, of course, if we were going to going to jump over into physics and back into chemistry, then that would be a problem because U in physics means velocity. Anyway, so how do we use that to find the element? Well, as it turns out, uh, the definitive number for an element, of course, is the atomic number. There's no doubt of that. But if you know the uh, mass, the atomic mass, you can also get pretty close. Notice that as this one gets bigger, this one gets bigger. Okay, so you just follow it down 196.2. Let's see. There we go. The one to the left of it is 183.8, 190.2, one in the middle. Yeah. So we're actually talking about rhenium. Weird thing. You, you didn't have to memorize that one. I'll steal the video. Okay. So here's our mold. And the mold is, is defined and uh, linked to the real physical property. Uh, I can't describe to you how it's determined, but periodically the mold is refined. At 6.022, like these numbers uh, is plenty good for our work. When they make refinements, they make refinements out to like eight or nine decimal place. Like making the calculation with high after the after the furthest digit. Yes, yeah, right. They refine that, but at a certain point, something. you say, "Who cares? It's, it's not going to affect your calculation any." It's so small, it's not going to be right. Okay, so there's by definition one mole of carbon uh, will be this many atoms and they will weigh naturally occurring carbon will be 12.01 grams. Now, if you have uh, carbon 12 isotopes, then of course one mole of carbon 12 isotopes will be this many atoms and it will weigh exactly 12 grams. Okay, so if we have 4.48 moles sample of iron, how many iron atoms do we have? This is a um, conversion factor problem. Right? 
So you just need an equivalence that will cancel moles and leave you with a house. If you do it that way, say, where am I, where am I going? Then you fill in what's required in the middle. Then you look for the number. So what's the equivalence? One mole is this. Then the rest of it is crunching numbers. If you approach it that way, uh, then the, the problem is not quite as daunting. So um, that also uh, emphasizes the importance of learning how to work your calculator, right? Learning how to how to input scientific numbers, scientific notation, and setting up your calculator so that when it spits out an answer, it gives it to you in scientific notation. Okay. So you might have to go. All calculators are different. Some of them. Uh, are set up one way and some are set up another way. You just have to go to your owner's manual and find out how to do that. I don't think any modus calculator is going to go to 24 zeros. If we got 24 zeros, it would be 10 to the 24th for most. Yeah, if you had, now, if, if you've got a large number, it will go, it will uh, fill your display and truncate or, or round, actually. Electronically, they truncate, but they, they go out and they calculate down here. So when they truncate, it's, it has the same effect of rounding. <clears throat> but uh, if you have a number that's very small, like 0 .000000 on out like that, if you don't have scientific notation set up, your answer might be zero. Yep. So you need to be sure and set up your calculator so it at least spit the answer back to you in scientific notation so you don't lose the answer. <clears throat> so, that value I was talking about before, this is called molar mass. That, that many grams for a mole of those atoms. Okay. Now, how do you do it for a compound? Very simple. You just add up the molar masses for all the atoms in the formula. So, if you have uh, one oxygen, it'll be... Um, 16.00. I always round off two places that you can pretty good. That's good enough for us. And then hydrogen, you need two of them. So hydrogen is 1.01, 2.02 for the amount of hydrogen in water. Add them together, you have 2.02 grams per mole, mole of water. For something bigger, you just have to be careful with the formula that you take into account. If it's got any parentheses in it, that subscript needs to propagate through everything inside the parentheses. Right. So that means you actually have two nitrogens and six oxygens. So when you calculate, this is for the barium, and we, we left off the moles here because it was cluttered the screen. So it's this many grams per mole of barium, and two times the grams per nitrogen and six times for oxygen. So that is the molar mass of that formula, barium nitrate. Well, that's why it's so important and why I, I hammered that so much in the beginning, learn how to write your formula. You've got to write the formulas correctly or you're lost in the wilderness. So do we know that that's correct? Barium comes from where? Right here. In the second column, that means it's plus two charge. Nitrate is polyatomic ion. You find it on your table. Negative polyatomic. one. Negative one. So that means you need two of them. And since polyatomics all behave as a single unit, you can't bust it up. You can't say N2O6 as part of the formula. You have to say NO3, take it twice. That goes for all polyatomics. They behave as a single unit. Okay. This is kind of a dumb slide, actually. 
which the following is the closest average mass of one atom of copper. <laughs> if you know anything about if these are values for one mole, 10 to the 23rd atoms, you know that none of these are going to be right. This is the only one that makes sense. But you can calculate it. You just need to know what's the molar mass of copper, which is 16.55, and do the appropriate math. So one carbon atom, we're going to convert it. How many moles is one carbon atom? Well, it's really a fraction because one mole of copper is this many copper atoms, so the atoms cancel. These are the moles, and now you can convert moles to grams using the molar mass of copper, and the value comes out to Okay? Conversion factors. They are your friend. Next to the periodic table, they're your best friend. The periodic table is your very best friend. <clears throat> so, this is kind of a trick question, too. How many copper atoms are there in a sample of 63.55 grams? Uh, the that one mole. Yeah. Right. So, 6.027 times 10 to the 23? 2 2. Sorry. There you go. I was off by five point zero five. Yeah, I don't know if that would have mattered on them. Well, if you have a let's see, we got somebody new. Kessa. It finally let me on here. I'm sorry. My Zoom was being weird, and it finally let me on here. Oh, I don't see your picture though. Do you have a camera? There you go. Yeah. yeah. If it finally let me on here, it was being weird. I don't know what was wrong with it. Okay. So Kess is here and uh, after, Alicia. Alicia, thank you. Yep. Let <laughs> me mark you guys before I forget. So we're doing a recording, so uh, all you have to do is, in a couple of hours, go look on Blackboard and you'll find the parts that you missed. <clears throat> I forget where I was, so I'll just pick it up with the next slide. So now we're gonna we're gonna go a little dig a little deeper. If you have a hundred gram samples of each one of these elements. Magnesium, zinc, and silver. Magnesium, zinc, silver. So we've got 100 grams. The question is, which contains the greatest number of atoms? Magnesium. Okay. That's true. Why? Because it has the least amount of molar mass. Right. It takes more of them, right? It's the mass as the rest of them. That's true. Yeah. The lighter atom takes more of them to make up the 100 grams. Yep. So this is your, this has the greatest number of atoms. Okay. Come on. There we go. Now here we're going to a little bit deeper. Let's see, I need to put them in a different order. Silver, zinc, and magnesium. So we have different masses for these. 107.9, 107.9 grams of silver, <laughs> of zinc, and 21 of magnesium. And the question is, put them in order from greatest number to least number. We can't use the molar mass as a direct indicator because they're different masses. So, here's the trick. How are they related to moles? Well, silver 107.9 is just the, is one mole of silver. 
Okay, so that's equal to one mole, right? Okay. How about zinc? It's greater than one mole, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. And magnesium could be 24.3, so it's less than one mole. Now we can put them in order. So from greatest to least, it would be zinc is greater than silver is greater than magnesium. Based on numbers of atoms, right? Because this one, the mole is a measure of numbers. If you compare the moles, you're comparing the numbers. You don't actually have to convert them to numbers. And that way we didn't have to even use a calculator. Okay. The next one, let me see where I am on, on time. Because I want to be sure I can get to every tile. So we've got to 145. I got about 40 minutes. And we're at this point. We can pick up the base. Okay. For this one, uh, I use Henry Ford. You're going to have to do a calculation over and over and over again. Set it up so that you do it one way, and then you, once you're satisfied it's done that way, say, okay, everybody else do the same type of calculation. So we're going to, uh, we've got 100 gram samples of each of the following. We're going to rank them from greatest to least number of oxygen atoms. And so we've got uh, water. Laughing gas, C3H6O2, propionic acid probably, and CO2. We've got 100 grams of each one. So we're going to convert 100 grams of each one of these in my assembly line. So we need a conversion factor first to convert them to moles of compound. So we need so many grams here, converting to moles here. All right, so we need water, we calculated that one earlier, it's 18.02 grams per mole. N2O is, uh, let's see, 2802 plus 16. Okay. And then uh, propionic acid is uh, 3 times 1201 is uh, 3603. And then 606 for the hydrogen, and then 32 for the oxygen. <laughs> uh, 7409. And then CO2, which is uh, carbon is 1201, and two oxygens is 32. 4401. Okay. So that will cancel the grams and give us moles of compound. Okay. So each one of these is moles of compound. So we've got rid of these. Now we want uh, moles of compound, moles of oxygen. Right? Compound. And moles of oxygen. What's the ratio for each one of these? Well, for each mole of compound, how many moles of oxygen do you have? For this one, it's one to one. For this one, it's one to one. For this one, it's two for every one. And for this one, it's also two. So now we got rid of these. And our answer, we're left with moles of oxygen. 
and you just calculate 100 divided by 18 times 1 divided by 4402 times 1 divided by 7409 times 2 divided by 4401 times 2. And then you can compare them. We don't have time to do that, but it's going to be this row CO2 and CO2. No, I don't know. I did do this row of CO2 as was the last one. This one because it weighs a little. Yeah. This one because it's got a couple plus it. Weighs the same as this one, but it has twice twice the weight of the bottom. Uh, the trouble is where it put that one. Yeah, those two are missing. But if you do that calculation, you'll end up with numbers here and you just compare them. But the, the point is when you have a problem like this and uh, you need to do a, a complex calculation, it helps to set up an assembly line like that. Because see, notice we did the same type of calculation all the way across. The only thing we did was we changed these numbers based on the compound that we have here and here. So once you set it up one way, then you know that uh, you're doing the calculation correctly because your, your units cancel. You just have to have the right numbers in there for the Okay. So here's an important skill that you need in stoichiometry. <clears throat> it's to understand what we mean by mass percent of an element in a compound. Really very simple. The mass percent is just the mass of the element in the compound divided by the total mass of the compound. So if you have a formula, it's easy to calculate. Okay. In water, what you assume is that you've got a mole. Right? So if you assume you have a mole, then the, the total mass of that mole is 18.02 grams, right? But if you have a mole, you also have one mole of oxygen. How much does a mole of oxygen weigh? 16. 100. So that's your percent of oxygen. You do the same thing for hydrogen, but you need two hydrogens. So this is for oxygen. And for uh, hydrogen, you would have 2.02 grams because it's 2 times 1.01. But you still have the same denominator. And the reason we can do that is we are assuming we have a mole. That makes it simple. If you assume you have a mole, and we can do that because this is a ratio and the unit cancel. You can assume you have two moles if you want to. But if you have two moles, then you got to double everything. But if you double everything, the twos are going to cancel anyway. It'll be a little less than 2% and a little more than 90%. Right. So that's how you calculate the percent composition. Am I, am I right in thinking that? Oh, I don't know. Yeah, I'm going to say that uh, 16 divided by 18 is I think, a little bit more than 90. 16, 18, 02. All right. 88, 88. Oh, something like 2. Oh, well. Okay. So this one should be uh, 119, right? Wait, 119? Let's see. One, one, no, 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 I'm two. Two. <laughs> two. So a little bit more than 10, a little bit less than 90. Yeah. Let's see if that works. Oh, we man, I don't see. This one we had to hold to three significant. We could make this in four significant. Okay, so that's percent composition. That's how you calculate it from a formula. 
But what a bench chemist does in the lab is they take the sample and, if necessary, purify it and then analyze it for its element of compound composition and come out with percent this, percent that. I mean, actually, the analytical process gives you the percent composition. And if you know that, then you can calculate, you can work through, and, and eventually end up with the formula for the molecule. I'll show you how to do that. Yeah, well, like the formula. This one, iron three oxide, if we use that as an example, to do the calculation, this says it's 69.94% iron. Using the same procedure, we have two irons. And notice, we also have two irons in the denominator, because they're part of the whole, right? The denominator has to be the whole. So you got the elements you're analyzing for, or you're calculating for, in the numerator and the denominator, plus in the denominator, everything else. Times 100. Um, all right, this is going to take too much time to do, but if you do that calculation like we did, um, the inner forward, right, you're going to do percent composition for each one of these, and the 100 grams, it doesn't matter. Right? Uh, 100 grams could be 200, could be 400, it does not matter. When you're calculating percent composition and you have the formula, you just use the method I showed you. And you get percent for each one of these oxygens, and you can compare them. Okay. I'm sure there are some practice problems in the review document that do just that. It should be the same as the... Should be the same as what? Uh, the amount of oxygen should be the same uh, as the percent of oxygen when you're comparing the like rank from highest to lowest percent oxygen, it should also be highest to lowest uh, mass of oxygen in a in a given compound. Oh, if you have the same mass of the compounds. Yes. Yeah, right. The percent would, would be the same order. So But the numbers may not be the same. But uh it's the same order as it was before with the mass. Uh, oh, when we were looking at the um, uh, the moles of oxygen? Yeah, the number of moles of oxygen uh, should correlate with percent oxygen? I think so. Let me see. Okay, here it is. Rank the greatest to least number of oxygen atoms. Water, CO2. Yep. Same order. So, the reason being, um, the number of oxygen atoms uh, are related. I mean, all you have to do is multiply them by the same value. Since you're multiplying by the same value, they're going to be in the same order. Yeah, that's true. Okay, here's what we do with percent composition. You can use percent composition. So you have so much percent carbon, so much percent hydrogen in this case. And you can determine the empirical formula. So what's the empirical formula? The empirical formula is the simplest whole number ratio of atoms in a compound or moles of element in a compound. The simplest whole number ratio. Let me show you what I mean. If we know the formula for a compound is um, uh, this. Now I'm just going to tell you that's benzene. The simplest whole number ratio is reduce that by some divisor. If you can divide six into both of them, that means its empirical formula is CH. If you have uh, uh, acetylene, its empirical formula is the same. Because so you can reduce it by a factor of two. For a factor of six, you get the same value. 
So like C two H six O two would be C H three O. Yep. C H three O. The empirical formula for that. Okay. Yep. Now if you have one that cannot be reduced, like if you have uh oh I'll just make something up. Uh C three H five. You can't reduce that one any further. So that one is C3H5. That's the empirical formula. It may also be the molecular formula. Molecular formula actually says how many atoms of this element are in the molecule. Whereas this one, for instance, that's benzene. So each one of these positions is a carbon, six carbons. And each one has a hydrogen attached to it. So you have six and six. This does not tell you that. <laughs> okay. But this is a step on the way to telling you that. You just need one more piece of information. So the actual, the molecular formula um, is actually the empirical formula times some value that propagates through each one of these subscripts to give you that. So what we're looking for is what is in. So to go from the empirical to the molecular. So in the case of the CH, the CH will be two, right? Right. The N will be two here, it will be two here, it will be six here. Right. So that's what we're looking for. That's our target. Uh, this just shows you how uh, Carbohydrates can be analyzed. I've used one of these before. It's called a carbon chain or a combustion chain. So you, you blow a lot of excess oxygen through here and you burn your sample. And it, uh, this one collects the water from your sample, which determines hydrogen. And this one determines carbon by collecting CO2. And then by difference, you know what oxygen is left over in your sample. So we're not going to go through that. It's just a demonstration of one of the ways of doing it. There are a host of different ways that you can analyze a sample. Some are more sophisticated than that. That's old school. That's otherwise known as wet chemistry. But you can determine elemental composition with a mass spectrometer. That's probably the, the neatest way. Uh, yeah, in many cases, right. Okay, so let's take this one as an example. We're going to work this one out in detail. We've got a sample, uh, a dipic acid, which is one of your fatty acids, right? and it's 49.3% carbon. It's 6.9% hydrogen. And it's 43.8% oxygen. Okay. Now, we need to find out what is the molar ratio of these three, CHO. We want a formula that will give us those empirical values. The simplest whole number ratio is all we can do from the percent composition. The simplest ratio of X, Y, and Z for these. Okay. Problem is, percent is a dimensionless number. There's no way to convert that to moles, unless you make an assumption. This is parts per hundred, right? So let's say we have 100 grams. Right? So if you assume 100 grams, now you've got grams per 100 grams. So we got 49.3. Grams, 6.9 grams, and 43.8 grams. So now we can work with that. So for carbon, we want to convert this to moles. Okay. We convert this to moles. We want to convert this to moles. We just need the correct value. So for carbon, okay. 12.01 for carbon, hydrogen 1.01, the 
and oxygen. Okay, so now we can find out what is the molar ratio of these elements in that compound. Uh, let's see, 49.3. So I get 4.105 moles of carbon. And 6.9 divided by 1.01 is 6.832. Uh, in this one, 43.8 divided by is 2.738 moles of oxygen. Okay, we're not there yet, are we? Because those are not whole numbers. So how do we make those whole numbers? First, you have to recognize that this ratio is fixed. This is an accurate ratio of carbon to hydrogen to oxygen. So that ratio will still exist if we multiply by something or divide it by something. If we divide everything by the same number, we still have the same ratio. Multiply it by a thousand. Why would we want to do that? Because then you have a whole number of 6832. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. I choose not to. <laughs> I'd rather divide by the smallest number. That means that this one will be one, so at least we have one of them as a whole number. This one by the right of us, two, seven, three, eight. Let's see, I'm doing as I go. Technically speaking, that is correct. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> so this one is rounded off 2.5. This one, two, seven, three, eight. I believe that's 1.5. Okay, so we're getting closer. And when you're doing these types of calculations, um, if your number is very close to a fractional, like uh, a 0.5, like a half, or a 0 0.333, like a third, the reason that you can that, that then you can round it to that value is that it's what we're going to do next. How do we get rid of these fractions? Multiply the two. Multiply the whole thing by two. That's right. So that gets rid of this half, this half, and keeps this two. So that's five, and that's three. If it was a three, we multiply. If it was, if it was point three three, three, three it would yes. be my, by three. By three. Even though it would be one point nine nine, you know. Yeah. Or if it was a quarter, you multiply by four. Point two five multiplied by four. You got to get rid of the fraction, so you have a whole number. So now we have. Uh, C3, H5, O2, and that's our empirical formula. Okay, so now we're looking for what do we multiply that by to give us the molecular formula? If it's one, then that is the molecular. That would be the American formula. But we need, yes. But we're given this piece of information. Oh, 146 grams. That's the actual molar mass of the compound. Right. So we know how to calculate molar mass. And we can also calculate what I call uh, empirical weight for this. We just say three times six, uh, three times 12.01 plus five times 1.01 plus two times 16. Add those together, and I think it comes out in the neighborhood of uh, 73. Yeah, I believe it comes out in the neighborhood. So it's grams per mole empirical weight, and this one is 146. 72. 146. It, it's, it's 72, I think, it's really. Well, this is? Because it's uh, 36 six. plus 32. 3603. Oh, wait, 3603, okay. 
Bible 5 and 32. Eight, and oh, you were right. Sorry, that's seventy-three oh eight. I got the score. So that's seventy-three oh eight. Uh, and still, we just want to get close. So the actual molecular weight is equal to one hundred forty-six grams per mole. So notice that this is twice what that is. So if n were equal to two. We get this for our molecular weight. Right. So, um, for calculation purposes, you take this one, divide it by that one, and the nearest whole number gives you n. In this case, it's two. So our molecular formula is C six H ten O four. Okay. All right. It might take some practice. But we will take some practice. Let's just be honest. <clears throat> um, so, in this case, this is a Chemical reaction. We always put the reactants first on the left, separated by an arrow, and then the product. Don't you have to burn that though? Huh? That one you have to burn to to get the CO two H two O. Yes, this is a combustion. Combined with oxygen, it's a combustion. It's also an oxidation reduction reaction. But it doesn't just happen automatically, it's spontaneous. It doesn't. It, no. Not in our lifetime. No. It, it will happen very slowly. Um, this, this will be oxidized very slowly to these compounds. But if you really want it to happen quickly, you just touch a match to it and off it goes. You have to exceed the activation energy for the reaction, is the proper terminology. <clears throat> but once you get it going, it provides enough energy to keep the reaction going until it's all gone. Now that's what you would get in an alcohol lamp, like uh, sterno, eat the food. Or if you drink the stuff, your cells will do that same reaction, only they do it in steps. Right? This is the overall reaction. Your cells do it in steps so that you don't burn the cell off. Right? You extract the energy little by little from the oxidation of this for those products. And then you, you breathe out CO2 and the water becomes part of the interstitial tissue. You also breathe out water. But it does. <clears throat> okay, so that's the order. And you have to write your compounds correctly or your elements. Right? Remember, this is diatomic. If you don't write oxygen diatomic, it never balances. And the way it balances is with these numbers right here, the coefficients. Once you write your compounds correctly for reactants and products, the only way to balance it now is with these coefficients. After the compounds or elements are written correctly, you can't touch them. You can only balance with coefficients. And this one is balanced right now. We know it's balanced because there's one oxygen, there's six, that's seven. And there's four oxygens, three oxygens, seven oxygens. So if you count up the numbers on either side, they have to be equal. And we're going to do that. So we'll get there. <clears throat> um, this is the overall reaction. Things might be going on inside that we don't know about. That arrow, there's probably, there may be multiple steps in that arrow between reactants and products. But, but we're not concerned with that now. We're only concerned with overall. What are the reactants going in? What are the products coming out? Now, those numbers could mean that you have um, the coefficients. You could have two molecules of something, or you could have two moles of something. 
the ratios are still the same, whether it's individual molecules or moles. Okay, so let's, uh, oh yeah, balanced by inspection. And I thought that was, that's a comical term. Every chemistry book I've ever looked at says balanced by inspection. It's a cop out. They don't tell you how to balance. They just say, this is, this is what you've got when you finish balancing. You've got equal numbers of atoms on both sides. But they don't tell you how to get there. Right? I've worked that out myself because there's no chemistry textbook that I know of. No chemistry professor has ever taught me to do it. I just figured it out on my own. So you get the benefit. Um, these are helpful hints. These are not step by steps, but these are helpful hints. And um, first you write your reaction, and then you set up a budget. How many atoms or moles of each on each side do you start with? You know where you start with, and then you keep a running correction for how many you have as you go. That way, when you get there, you know you're there. And there are other things that are interesting to, to notice. Um, if you've got an element on one side or the other, it doesn't matter, on one side or the other of your um, equation, save it to last. Because if you put a coefficient in front of that, that's the only thing it changes. You've got to mess with the rest of the equation once you put a coefficient in front of that. Um, and it's, it's also helpful sometimes to keep water to last, if you can. Also, um, when you balance an equation, the accepted technique is to end up with a whole number coefficient. But on your way there, there's nothing that says you can't use fractions. Sometimes it's more efficient in the process of balancing to stick a fraction in there. That will balance the equation, and then you get rid of the fraction. Right? If it's a half, you just multiply the whole thing through by two. It gets rid of your fraction. So this will be 2, 25, 16, 18. After you multiply through. Um, for polyatomic ions, if you have polyatomic ions in your equation, and they do not change from reactant side to product side, keep them together. They're not going to break apart in the reaction, so you might as well just keep them together. And that saves you a lot of calculation where you don't have to put individual oxygen atoms or individual phosphorus atoms. You just keep the phosphate group as a balancing group and balance it both sides. That saves a lot of effort. Okay, so here's our example. No, we're out of time. Uh, let me see what I'm missing. A lot. Okay, what do we got in chapter four? Maybe I can bleed over into chapter four. Okay. We finished this one. Limiting reactants. That's the one we're going to be missing. And percent yield. So we'll, we'll get this done, run out of time, and I'll mark it, and we'll pick up with limiting reactants and uh, percent yield on Wednesday, and then go from here into chapter four. Okay, so let's do this. Let's take our time on this one. So here's what we're starting with aluminum phosphate. I'm going to leave out the, uh, the alias part. It just takes up killing proof. Plus calcium chloride. Notice I'm leaving a gap here. So I can put coefficients in there. And then ammonium chloride. Okay. And you should be confident that your compounds are written correctly. Plus one charge, minus three charge, so you need three of these. Two plus here, minus one there, so you need two of those. 
this is three minus, this is plus two. So the best way to write that compound is take two over here, three over here. Just cross multiply. And Okay. And these are plus one, minus one, so they're good. Okay. First thing you do is set up your, your table, like I did here. So we have ammonium. Since ammonium's on both sides, we'll hold it together. Now I'm not going to put the charge in there. We don't need it to do this balancing act. And we have phosphates. We have calcium. And we have chloride. Okay. So now you, you start your budget with how many do I have? We got three of these. Three ammonias on this side. I got one phosphate, one calcium, two chloride. On this side, we have one ammonia. We have two phosphates. We have three calciums. And we have one chloride. Okay? So it's obvious. We're not balanced because three and one, one and two, one and three, two and one. That's not balanced. This is common molecule. Now? Or is that was that what we were doing over here? Uh okay. So my I have a thing that's out of my head, but uh, the question first question is where do you start? My 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 way of doing this is just seeing the coefficients. And then, uh, because the, uh, you can't have more than three. Okay. Uh, so, say for example, the NH4Cl, uh, because there's two Cl, that has to be two. Here? Yeah. Okay. If you put two over there, that gives you two ammonias and your short one. But, so that has to be three. Sure, that's okay. Is that where you want to start? Yes. Okay, so we'll start with ammonia. We've got three here, and we need three here. So that gives us three ammonia there, and three chlorine there. Okay? Now what? Do you want to go to chlorine, or do you want to just go to phosphorus and see what happens to chlorine later? If we make uh, two phosphorus there, if we make two over here, that gives us two phosphates, but it gives us six ammonia. Okay. How about calcium? Calcium three, what if we put three calcium here? Six chlorine and six chlorine. Okay. So now, if we bump this one up to six for ammonia, that gives us six here, six here, and we're balanced. So if you set up a budget like that <clears throat> and keep track of it as you go, then you know when you're balanced. And then I did a little animation here. Play it at your leisure. I think I did it in a little different order. I think I started with uh, calcium first. Sometimes, if, if you've written your compounds correctly and you follow this procedure, you'll get there. Just some are more efficient to get there quicker. Depends on where you start. And the only way you know to start uh, a more efficient position is having done a bunch of them. Okay. Any questions? This just illustrates the point that this balanced equation is correct as that. Or is that, or is that, but we prefer the simplest whole number ratio of coefficients.
Uh, okay. Let's see. This is very important. Once you've written your compounds, don't balance with subscripts. Leave the subscripts alone. Only balance with coefficients. So now, if you if you start trying to balance an equation, and you go over and over, back and forth, up and down, and it never balances, go back and check your compounds. Be sure they're written correctly. Subscripts make a compound as atoms make a, as protons make an atom. Okay. Okay, because you can't have, because one less subscript is not the same compound, and one less proton is not the same atom. Oh, we're out of time. Uh, 45, yeah, we're past, we're past time. So I'm going to mark my, uh, PowerPoints, and we're going to pick it up right here uh, Wednesday. I think we can finish the, the discussion on Wednesday, and then we'll get into the lab. Okay. See you Wednesday. All righty. Bye. I'll Bye. see you tomorrow, actually. See me tomorrow? Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, I'll see you tomorrow. Okay. Bye. Bye. -bye.